Hello. We are now in the in the session for uh, the keynote, but uh, we have uh, one major problem. We are missing our keynote speaker. And uh, at the moment, I don't know uh, what is the problem. Uh, Lionel uh, Brian was uh, supposed to, to give a keynote, as you have he heard, but uh, I don't get any connection with him. So at the moment, I don't know uh, uh, how we will continue because uh, I, have, I sent him, uh, yeah, Facebook, I'm not using the, the there was a message uh, that I should check a Facebook. I'm not using Facebook, but uh, I tried with Skype and uh, with mail and uh, so far have not got uh, any sign from uh, Lionel. So, uh, okay, I got a message from Claudia uh, uh, that uh, she will try to find him. I, I think uh, that, that is great. Uh, so, so maybe in the meantime, uh, okay, if you have uh, some questions, maybe you can ask. At the moment, it's only me who is running this live. Uh, so uh, uh, I can try to answer or uh, we can reply with uh, on the chat. Okay, I got some uh, message. Uh, let me see from Skype. But uh, okay, it's not from Lionel. Okay. So still, uh, sorry uh, for uh, waiting. Okay, so uh, we, we have got one question from uh, Jane uh, to keep chat going. What key as a problem is everyone applying AI to? Okay, if someone wants to write this. Uh, yes, uh, and we, we can add you to backstage. So, uh, uh, so uh, Lucy, you can add Jane to back backstage, and Jane, you can uh, you can ask them this question. So, anyone uh, who uh, wants to go come in to discussion, we can add in the backstage. So, uh, so that could be that could be good. So we can have a discussion while. Uh, Lionel is coming. Okay, so the, you, you can see there are many, uh, um, oh, many uh, great uh, communication, the uh, discussion uh, on, on the chat. So, so another way of question is what key AI problem is everybody blind to S S E two? And uh, Henry also said, adapting the SA function based on quality attributes. Yes, so. Uh, uh, 
Okay, so we are now, uh, more people will come to the backstage to having a, a discussion. There is also one interesting question, uh, uh, what Henry mentioned, uh, machine learning for software architecture. Uh, so, so I would see also here like two, um, two perspectives of that. So, so you, you may have a question, what kind of software architecture you need for successful ML uh, implementation and uh, operation? And the other is, uh, uh, I don't know if you have thought that, Henry, or, or to use ML to get the best architecture. Okay, that's an interesting uh, proposal from Hans Martin. Maybe we can collect already some questions for Lionel. I think that's that's a good idea. And uh, an interesting question from uh, IPEC. Whether SE, software engineering for AI, is the same as AI engineering? Yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a, a really great question because uh, that's maybe similar to the question if software engineering, how it is related to, to the system engineering. Uh, obviously, we have a lot of things which are uh, which belong to AI engineering and which have not been a part of uh, software engineering. For example, how to manage uh, data. Uh, will data become a part of software engineering? So far, data were like integrated in um, algorithms in software. And there are many questions which are pure data related questions. But now they are becoming extremely important. So, so th this is an interesting question. Uh, most probably, a software is uh, like uh, control it, controlling everything. Then that uh, AI engineering is like part of software engineering for AI, or or uh, everything what we have in AI engineering will be also a matter of software engineering. Uh, okay, we are trying also to have several people into the uh, live session so that we can uh, have a more lively discussion. Yes, we have uh, Jan coming in, so... Uh, uh, hello, Jan. Hello there. Yeah, hey, back. sorry about the hassle with uh, uh, getting Lionel on board. I was thinking maybe if it, uh, you could show the research agenda we worked on and maybe talk through that a little bit. Can you find it or should yes. I pull it up? Maybe you can put it. You can put it if you have it. Uh, uh, because uh, that's related very much to that uh, uh, workshop. Exactly. So let me go and uh, I will just pull up the slide and then you can decide who talks to it. Maybe you can talk to it as well or we can talk to it. Uh, let me just figure out. Uh, hello. I hope it's live now. Yes. So, I can see it. so do you want to talk about it or should I? No, you, you can, you can do it. 
Good. So while and uh, while we are waiting, because of course this is not the intent of uh, uh, we want Lionel to uh, present the work uh, or his work. But what uh, we've done between Helena, who's now also in the video, um, Ivica and myself, is that based on the I think close to 20 case studies or cases that we've done, well over 40 challenges. Uh, that we identified, we try to capture an AI research agenda. And uh, that is the summary of that is what you now uh, currently see on the screen. And what we basically do here, and, and while we're waiting for, uh, uh, and again, once Lionel is ready to go, I mean, we'll, we're gonna stop this. But what we basically do is if you look at the traditional data science process, then basically you have the four stages that you also saw in the introductory slides, which is you assemble the data, you create and evolve the model, you train and evaluate, and then you deploy. And of course, there are some iterative uh, processes because uh, typically the first model you generate doesn't quite ge generate the results that you want. And of course, in industrial context, and I'm hoping that, uh, for instance, Alexander uh, from Microsoft will talk about it uh, tomorrow, uh, people do not only do DevOps on the software side, they also do uh, a kind of continuous deployment or AI ops or ML ops on the machine learning front. So machine learning and deep learning models are actually updated in the same frequency as the rest of the software's update, at least that's what we see. If you look at each of those phases, we believe that there are four strategic focus areas. I mean, in the first assemble the data set, data quality management is really one of those uh, challenges that um, many companies are really struggling with. We really see that it is much harder to get assemble high quality data sets than what many people uh, think about. If you look and uh, into the uh, deep, in, into the creating the models, it is very unclear how you establish systematic and structured design methods and processes to come to well-performing models in a predictable fashion. I think that that's still a little bit of a black art in the data science community, and that, of course, doesn't work well uh, when we are uh, as software engineers. Training and performance, it's a lot about model performance. And then, of course, deployment, and especially the compliance, which is one of those things that Lionel will talk about in a, around trustworthiness, are the, for us the primary focus areas in each of these stages or phases of the data science process. And if you then look at the blue part of the slide, you can see that we have an AI engineering uh, set of challenges that we've categorized under architectural challenges, development challenges, process challenges. And under those, you can identify a number of topics. Uh, for instance, we recently published a paper on data ops that some of you may be interested in, which clearly falls under, under development. Um, uh, Lucy has, for instance, looked quite a bit into monitoring and logging, uh, which is under process and under the deployment and compliance. I mean, because especially in regulated industries, you also have to show for sometimes for every individual transaction whether you did the right thing or not. Uh, A-B testing is one of those things that we see happen when it comes to model performance, also an interesting uh, uh, aspect. Uh, we have um, uh, uh, Jennifer Horkoff in the, in the call, who's looking uh, in the meeting, who is looking into uh, quality attributes. So how do we actually prove uh, or and, and work with non-functional requirements when it comes to machine learning, which I think is also a very interesting uh, subject to, to look into. Um, and then if you go to the uh, right side of the of the blue line, um, we are in a situation where we have um, we, we identified that there were in specific domains, uh, very uh, pre specific challenges for that domain. So, for instance, in cyber physical systems, you typically have hundreds or thousands of devices out in the field. And all those devices perhaps want to do reinforcement learning or other kinds of things. And there you want to get to federated learning. So you really want to figure out how can I use those hundreds or thousands of devices to actually benefit from the fact that they are all consisting or, or existing in a population, which I think is one of those interesting areas. Another topic that one of um, EVG and mine PC students worked on is, for instance, heterogeneous hardware, because in embedded systems, you're really looking for reducing the total bill of materials, but you still want high performance. 
And then you see that GPUs, ASICs, FPGAs, and other types of uh, mechanical uh, of, of hardware uh, is really helpful to get higher performance at a lower cost. But then building the software and integrating the software is actually much harder than when you run everything on a homogeneous hardware platform. Around safety critical systems, it's a lot around uh, uh, keeping the data trail, working with explainable models, uh, safety validation, which in uh, the Gothenburg area, we have a lot of companies working on uh, autonomous drive of cars, where this is, of course, one of the big things. Uh, how do I actually uh, certify that uh, the machine learning or deep learning model that I have in a car for, uh, uh, for autonomous drive? Uh, no certification institute will accept a piece of software or a deep learning model without uh, the company really having done a convincing safety validation. And of course, reproducibility. If something bad happens, can we reproduce what happens? So, and then the final area, which I think is really interesting, and one of the areas where uh, we've started to look into, is um, what we call autonomously improving systems. And that is basically systems that in software, software intensive systems that know what better and worse looks like. Yeah, so in, in, in software as a service, for instance, conversion rate is what the thing that I'm always looking to improve. And then what I'm looking for is different ways like multi-armed bandits, which we looked into, reinforcement learning, algorithms, Q learning, etc. How do I build software intensive systems that can fully autonomously experiment with their own behavior so that they get better even after deployment by themselves without me having to manually put a lot of energy and time into that. And of course, there the question becomes, how do I balance the, the exploration and exploitation? How do I make sure that uh, the during exploration, I can in some way box or put boundaries around the worst case outcomes, etc. Now, the link to this uh, paper is in the chat. If you go scroll up a little bit. Uh, but what we were hoping to do is that also in the breakout sessions, we talk perhaps around some of these topics uh, uh, as, as a focus in order to make sure that we can have a uh, good and, uh, and solid discussion. If it's, uh, I can, of course, keep talking about this slide. I have lots of other slides too, but maybe you want to uh, take the session back and uh, share some words of wisdom and let me know when I should stop sharing my screen. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I think you can <coughs> keep this uh, screen sharing. So what I would like um, uh, maybe ask the audience uh, uh, to write a question related to that. So, so uh, in the meantime, uh, I would uh, state some questions which are slightly, which are very much related to the research agenda, but could be orthogonal autonomous in, in that way that uh, state some uh, principal questions in a sense is it software engineering now different for AI system what, what, are, what are the principles which are breaking which will be broken now which we know in software engineering and what kind of new principles we really have to include in uh, software engineering to be able to uh, manage such, such systems. Uh, I can give some examples. Uh, for example, uh, you, you know that uh, separation of concerns is one of the most important principles in software engineering. And in that sense, like separation code from data is one of, of the, the main principles. We are building functions and then we are using data processing through the uh, uh, validated and uh, verified and validated uh, algorithms, uh, for example, or through the infrastructure and uh, the entire system. But now we have a situation when uh, the code is actually a result of data. So, so and uh, we don't control data in the same way as we can control today in software engineering as, as, as we can control code. Uh, so, so, so one of the questions and one of the main problems, I think, which uh, uh, will come or which we see is this mixing of data and then dependencies of the data in the code. So that means that we would need to find new methods how to manage this complexity of 
data integrated the code. For example, that could be uh, related to the uh, version management and configuration management, dependency management, and which time of point we have to retrain the system because our data are not uh, the same as they were, for example, in the training. How do we, uh, in which way can we automatically on an efficient way uh, decide it? How can we uh, do the retraining and uh, integrate it with the uh, continuation change of software itself? So these are some basic principles which I think uh, should be uh, revisited and uh, some new solution would need to be found. Yeah. Can I take a question, uh, Ivic? Yes. Because I, there's an easy one. <laughs> the last one in the chat sorry it's not actually easy and jane yes. you, you raise i think a very important topic which is uh, a b testing how does that work in, in a safety critical environment and the interesting thing is that um volvo cars um, is now working on adding a b testing to cars for their employees which i think is uh, is uh, so they take employee cars and run a b test there which I think is a really interesting learning experience for everyone involved. But when it comes to the safety critical part, they basically now starting with functionality that has no or very, very small implications on the criticality or safety, safety of a car. But the idea is that when you want to run an AB experiment in a safety critical context, you have to safety certify both alternatives so you have to confirm and validate that both alternatives are safe, then you can deploy them, and then you can start to measure the difference in performance between the two. And, and this is actually quite interesting and quite relevant. Uh, one of the interesting examples for those of you that are aware of, um, um, uh, for those of you that are aware of active safety in cars, so active safety in the car is where the car interacts with the driver to avoid uh, uh, critical situations. Yeah, so you get all kinds of warnings from the uh, from the from the car when bad things happen. The point is, in that context, it is often very hard to predict how does the driver actually respond. And there are cases where the active safety system actually caused a less safe situation because the driver got so uh, surprised and shocked by the response of the system that you actually want to then work through A-B testing style approaches in order to get to the best outcome possible. But whatever you do from an A-B testing perspective, you still have to validate the quality. That's true across the board. You cannot just have bad quality, but you also need to have, um, 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 uh, in the case of safety, you need to have the safety certification. And then Jane adds a question to this. Um, She's entirely correct for those of you that are following the chat. ISO 26262 is a standard that allows um, uh, automotive companies to basically uh, self-certify their software. So there is not an external certification body like what you have in the FDA or other certification bodies in the medical space. Um, and yes, it is most certainly harder in certified domains. And what I think that we're going to see is that in the software as a service domain, we see that companies run thousands of A-B experiments per year, sometimes tens of thousands of A-B experiments. I think that in less uh, embedded systems that have no external certifiers, we will see dozens or hundreds of A-B experiments. And in the, certific the, the domains that have external certifiers, it will be much more difficult to run many A-B experiments. So they're only the most important A-B experiments uh, will be run because they would both have to be uh, certified. So Jane, you're spot on. Yes. I would uh, uh, maybe ask uh, you, Jan, uh, Jan uh, uh, related to that, if you look at the safety critical system, so the classical approach is like to uh, define as much as a possible limits on the scope, your boundaries of the system, and then keep them like fixed. Yeah. Uh, uh, in the new, uh, in the new system, 
people are uh, uh, engineers are trying to do more like a resilient system so the system which are more flexible in a sense that they can adjust to unpredictable uh, uh, to unpredictable events yeah so so do, do you see that this uh, AI gives a possibility for this flexibility or it's still or is it still uh, like this like a big limit or even even maybe more difficult to come yes. to proper prediction yeah so i think that and now i have to be a little bit careful and maybe helena wants to jump in here as well because we do work with a number of companies in the automotive domain and i have to be a little careful that i don't divulge any of their uh of their uh company confidential situation but what we basically see is a way in which functionality is validated in non-operations contexts that is one of the key things so that and and in those non-operational contexts we try to collect as much data as possible and one public example that i think everyone knows about is in the case of tesla they have basically two copies of the hardware in the car one version of the software and one set of hardware basically controls the car and runs the certified software and a second copy of the car uh, basically shadows the primary system and that's where i do my system validation and what you then see is that the companies that we work with are trying to collect as much data as possible in a non-critical context uh, in this case mirroring the the, the actual uh, behavior of the car and then moving to a situation where when the confidence is considered to be high enough to then switch. But that is of course uh, not an easy, uh, it's, it's something that I believe is still a very important research subject uh, for us in this community, the AI engineering community, um, and also something that the companies are really working with because currently, I think the first level four autonomous drive cars are on the road. So those are cars that do autonomous drive on the highway, but full autonomous drive. So level five, to the best of my knowledge, is not yet on the road because we haven't figured out how to deal with that. And Helene, if you want to jump in, go right ahead because you've been part of the same research. Also, thank you. Um, no, not really something to add, but maybe, I mean, we do see different different initiatives to in different ways try to start working with predicting uh, for example intentions etc so what is the system most probably going to respond to so to in different ways we see the companies trying to foresee what an object will do and uh, for example in automotive etc and it comes in different shapes and forms and I won't reveal those, but I guess in the call we have people that are well aware of these uh, these different initiatives on how to, as flexible as possible, being able to respond to things that we didn't really uh, predict in the very start. And now I see the Holly DevOps framework, so I guess that means, oh, and here we have a keynote. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. Hi, Lionel. You, 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 you can't hear how happy we are to see you. Actually, we're having a great time, to be honest. <laughs> yes. me, but <laughs> I hope you can hear us. Yes, I can. Okay, can you okay. Me? Yes, we can hear you. You are lively now. There are uh, 30 people looking at you, so uh, just for the record. Yes, thank you. Yes, I'm sorry. I wrote it on for tomorrow. I made a calendar mistake. I don't know. Anyway, I'm very sorry. <laughs> okay, but uh, so I'm uh, yes, uh, I'm ready if, uh, if you yeah. want. <laughs> because then we are going to not talk about the holistic DevOps model, but rather I'm going to stop sharing my screen, Lionel, uh, oh. and uh, I'm going to give the floor back to Ivica, so you can do yes. an accelerated 30 minutes uh, presentation of your keynote. I'll, okay. I'll, uh, I'll do my best. I I plan for more, yes. but uh, I'll stop when I stop. <laughs> I'm not yeah, too yeah. sure what else to do. Uh, all right, so let me see how I. Uh, okay. If it's your, I'm going to leave the room now, and then uh, okay. I leave it to you and Lionel. Yeah. Okay. okay. And, but, uh, and everyone, right. thank you for. Uh,
uh, listening in on us while we're filling the space that uh, Lionel so gracefully created for us. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I, I, I think that we all know uh, who Lionel is. And yeah, you so, don't so, need to introduce me. <laughs> so so I uh, skip the introduction and uh, give uh, the floor to you and uh, yeah. All right. Great to see you. Yeah, I'm uh, again. Uh, I apologize. I uh, I'm not. I have difficulties dealing with those remote conferences. You know, I'm really confused. <laughs> yeah, time is uh, it's really. But right. uh, uh, here is a lot of applause to you. All right. So yes, I guess you see my yes. screen, my slides. Yes, All right. All right. So. Uh, well, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, testing and safety of uh, uh, machine learning enabled systems, uh, as I call them. Uh, first, good morning from Canada. Uh, and that was not my plan for this Sunday morning, but I guess it's going to become one because I'm going to attend the workshop after that. <laughs> and uh, so this uh, presentation will attempt uh, to convey my personal perspectives uh, on the problem of ensuring that MN enabled systems are uh, trustworthy. Uh, this is not a survey, uh, it's based on both uh, my uh, personal experience and reading the literature. And uh, well, you know, I look forward to discussing this topic today with uh, everybody in the workshop. Uh, so, uh, oops, sorry, I got, I'm in the wrong place. <laughs> Let me get back to where I was supposed to be. Uh, so this work is, uh, what I'm going to present is based on uh, uh, collaborative work with a number of students and uh, colleagues uh, of the year. Uh, I'm going to skip that. So let me straight go straight to context and motivations. I guess if you attend that workshop, uh, I don't need to convince you that uh, ML components are increasingly part of safety or mission critical systems, uh, for example, in the automotive uh, system, uh, domain or uh, in the energy domain and many others. Uh, so, uh, and more particularly, uh, there is an increasing use of uh, deep learning and uh, reinforcement learning in the last uh, a few years. So, if we take an example in the automotive domain, uh, a number of tasks are increasingly done uh, using, for example, deep learning, such as uh, object detection, identification, uh, localization and prediction of movement, sensor fusion and scene comprehensions, scene comprehensions such as uh, lane detection, uh, driver monitoring, driver replacement, even functional safety uh, in various ways, and even uh, in power trends, uh, for example, motor control and uh, battery management. So I use the term uh, MN enabled systems. Uh, so uh, what happens usually is that you uh, you have a, a system interacting with the environment, and uh, that environment determines inputs and outputs uh, of the system. And within that system, you have a number of uh, machine learning components with their own input and outputs. And a typical example is an example from the automotive domain, where within the advanced driving assistance system, uh, you have decision and control components uh, that you can see here in purple and pink. Uh, and uh, that system, which is an example, the EDA system, which is an example of ML enabled system, uh, takes input from sensors and cameras, sensors from the car and sensors and cameras uh, uh, to provide information on the environment and of course control a number of actuators such as uh, the uh, you know braking system, the brake or the throttle for acceleration. Uh, there are different testing levels such as the ones that I mentioned by Ricky at all in the survey. Uh, such as model and system level for testing. Uh, the model level is when you test uh, machine learning model in isolation. Uh, and uh, that's where uh, most of the research is. Most of the research is, on, is focused on uh, testing such system at the model level. Uh, 
Uh, they are different also other levels, such as integration in system, which are similar to what you find uh, for when doing uh, regular testing. System level uh, can take place in the field or with the simulator uh, in the loop, as we will see. Uh, but there are cross-cutting concerns across all those levels, which is often scalability and uh, uh, realism. I'll get back to that. You have also uh, things that are related to information access. Uh, I'm a little, going a little bit fast on the basics because I assume that you are familiar with that to some degree. And uh, you know, I just lost 30 minutes. So uh, uh, you can uh, try to perform testing and analysis in a black box fashion where you only have access to uh, model inputs and outputs or you may assume that you get access to training and test set, or it can be completely white box and you have access to all, uh, uh, you know, runtime state information, hyperparameters, weights and biases in the case of deep uh, neural networks. But what is important is that even though a lot of the research is done at the white box and data box level in practice, for a number of reasons, that access is not guaranteed. Uh, for example, in the automotive domain, in many of the domains, uh, people uh, resort to third-party providers uh, who usually do not share that information with uh, their clients. So, in fact, it's uh, very often the case that access is, at all, is not at all guaranteed. And, uh, uh, well, in terms of uh, uh, objective, testing objective, people look at different things. Uh, from robustness to noise and attacks, for example, with adversarial attacks. Uh, but there are other aspects that have to be uh, looked at. Uh, but uh, what, is what is important is that anyway, a machine learning model uh, is always going to fail under certain circumstances. Uh, it may fail to imperfect training, be you know, because the training set uh, doesn't, uh, for example, capture certain corner cases, uh, but of course also uh, the wrong tuning of hyperparameters or wrong choice of model structure. Uh, but the question is, what do these uh, failures really entail for the system? And that's what uh, matters in the end. So, uh, so uh, we will talk about that uh, again. But so there are a number of challenges that we're in, some of them we're going to address, others not, uh, due to time constraints. So uh, the behavior is driven by training data in the learning process. Uh, we don't have, for those ML components, neither specifications nor code. So many of the techniques, for example, for testing, but all the forms of analysis that are based on either specifications or code uh, uh, cannot uh, really be employed here. Uh, the input space is purely autonomous systems, like the examples I've used before, uh, for those systems is, is absolutely huge. Uh, we don't really know what uh, test suite adequacy means in this context, even though there are a number of papers, like 30, 40 papers on that topic, but still uh, it's unclear what the results really mean. Uh, we have problems with automated oracles, and uh, very often the model results, or the test results, if you will, of the models uh, are hard uh, to uh, interpret. Uh, so it's hard to determine, for example, why something failed or why there was a misprediction. So uh, let me uh, go through uh, quickly, uh, again, uh, a number of uh, challenges. So for example, the large input space, for example, the Tesla autopilot uh, collects data from uh, several front, rear, and side uh, cameras, a radar, and 12 ultrasonic sensors, so you can imagine what uh, testing may look like for such a system. Uh, so, but in general, uh, uh, inputs take a variety of forms, images, code, text, simulation, configuration parameters, depending on the circumstance of testing, whether there is a, a simulator in the loop. So, well, you can imagine what uh, the input space can be. The Tesla example was quite uh, uh, telling. Uh, the cost of testation can be very high, not be only because uh, uh, the models themselves can have a, 
uh, millions of uh, neurons and all the system, if we are testing system level, it can be extremely complex. But because very often, for example, for autonomous systems, you have a simulator in the loop and the cost of simulation is very high. Uh, and if you don't have a simulator in the loop and if you don't have some form of automated oracle, then the labeling effort uh, can be uh, very high. Uh, so, uh, well, here is another example. I, I took very quickly the example of the Tesla example, but even uh, an automated emerging, uh, emergency braking system, uh, which has a, a sensor in the loop to identify uh, objects in the field of the car, and then a, a, a camera that decides whether that object is or is one is a, a pedestrian. Uh, so this is a class diagram of the input output domain model where you have things like road topologies, the scene light, the weather conditions, the roadside objects such as trees, park cars, buildings. Uh, and of course, uh, you have the trajectories of the pedestrians and cars. So as you can imagine, uh, even for a simple thing like that, uh, what uh, the input uh, model uh, looks like. Uh, so uh, as you already know, I don't need to dwell on that. Uh, you have, when you test, you, you can provide different type of inputs. You have adversarial inputs and you have natural inputs. Uh, natural inputs are uh, focused on uh, functional uh, aspects of functional testing, including functional safety. Uh, whereas adversarial uh, inputs are usually focused on robustness, robustness to noise, sensor noise, for example, or attacks. Uh, the first category is, ad is addressed mostly in the machine learning literature. There are some papers in the machine in machine learning uh, in software engineering venues, uh, but uh, uh, that's where most of the work is uh, in machine learning venues for adversarial inputs. So you probably know what adversarial examples are, given that you attend this workshop. Uh, but some time ago, people realized that applying some imperceptible noise or perturbation to a test image, for example. Uh, would lead to uh, arbitrary uh, changes in DNA predictions. Um, so, uh, what is important with adversarial inputs is that we don't really have an oracle problem because they are not expected to lead, that introduction of perturbation is not expected to lead to model, to changes in model predictions or decision. Uh, but the problem with those inputs is that they're often not realistic. Uh, many techniques are used for this, image processing, image transformation, for example, through generative adversarial networks, fuzzing. And there are many papers uh, on that, and I won't dwell much on that today. Most of them are not, as I said, even in software engineering venues. Natural inputs, uh, I mean, they are expected to be realistic, uh, but they may suffer from the oracle problem in the sense that you provide, let's say, a new image, you don't necessarily know what to expect in terms of prediction or classification. Right. If, oh, I can, oh. if I can interrupt you yeah. shortly, Lionel, so yes. we have extended the session 15 minutes, so so you have oh. plenty of time. All right, yeah. all right. Sorry. I, oh. I was trying to, to oh. improvise in real time, trying yeah. to get rid of material that is not essential. Oh. <laughs> all right, <laughs> thank you. Uh, all right. <laughs> Very nice to be so accommodating, uh, despite my absent mindedness. Uh, all right, so, uh, but uh, when generating uh, uh, realistic inputs, you need to worry about a number of things. How do you characterize and measure realism of inputs or the naturalness of inputs? Uh, you need uh, somehow uh, to do a number of things. Either you manage to start from existing inputs and you have somehow some domain-specific semantic preservative transformations. So people have been trying to use ideas around metamorphic transformations and relations that have been used in testing for a while, but it's not obvious, honestly. Very often those transformations are rather trivial. They do not allow a full exploration of the input space. Or you can use a high fidelity simulator, which uh, is increasingly common in many domains, which has existed for 
years in avionics, which is now increasingly common in automotive. Uh, but those inputs, anyway, uh, can be also of a different type. You have a different, uh, you have work, for example, on uh, uh, generating single image test inputs. Uh, so, for example, in the context of, that, of autonomous driving system, with the deep test by Channel O that perform greedy search with nine different realistic image transformation, changing brightness, changing contrast, translation, scaling, horizontal shearing, rotation, and, and so on, rain effect. Uh, but again, uh, the exploration of the input space is by definition uh, relatively limited and limited to single image test inputs. And this has uh, consequences. You can test via uh, you know, physics-based simulation. So for example, if it's an advanced driving assistance system running, uh, you know, the, all the, in, the inputs are provided by the simulator. The outputs go to the simulator that simulate the physical plant, uh, what they call it, vehicles, sensors, actuators, other cars, pedestrians, environment, weather, roads, traffic signs. And test inputs are basically uh, a configuration parameter values for the simulator. And test outputs basically provide information about all those things that are simulated uh, at different time ticks, including, thing, including events such as uh, collision. All right, so uh, most uh, of the existing research focus on testing DNA components, not systems. And there is a big focus on label preserving changes, for example, to images. Why? Because there is no uh, Oracle uh, problem. Uh, so, uh, therefore, uh, the research has tried to account for the impact of object dynamics, for example, the car speed in different scenarios, for example, specific configurations of roads uh, is limited um, in, the, in the context uh, of ADAS, but you can translate that remark to other application domains. Uh, and therefore, uh, uh, if you do testing that way, you are limited in, in the way you explore the input space, looking for functional safety violations, which is, uh, or functional violations in general, but for safety in particular, which is of course extremely important for most uh, autonomous uh, systems. And in the, uh, in actually in the automotive domain, I use often automotive example because that's easier. And uh, along with a couple of other domains, that's a domain I'm familiar with. But in the automotive domain, you have the former uh, SOTIF standard, which is now an ISO pass uh, road vehicles uh, standard, uh, which clearly specify that you are expected to perform in the loop testing with relevant scenarios in different environmental conditions. And uh, I'm not going to go into details, but they have a set of uh, requirements explaining what that means. Uh, so if you do testing <coughs> the way I've just presented and what you find in the literature, the software engineering literature, uh, you cannot uh, fulfill the requirements of that standard, which is now required when you, uh, you know, at least in Europe, when you uh, develop such ADAS systems. So people have been working on test accuracy criteria. You probably read those papers or seen those papers. Uh, there are about 30, 35 papers uh, on that focused on deep neural networks, uh, they all uh, tend to look in from, or all or most of them tend to use information from neural activation values or comparing training and test data. Uh, a lot of the uh, evaluation of the statistical equation is focused on finding adversarial inputs. And as you will see, uh, there is an excellent uh, ICSI 2019 paper, or near paper, that uh, shows, and I'll explain that in a minute, that this is actually a questionable mode of empirical evaluation. And of, all, of course, just as a reminder, all those test adequacy criteria require access to the DNA internals and even sometimes the training set. 
And as I said before, it's uh, not realistic in many practical settings. So there are many examples, but uh, given uh, that's not given the fact that's not the most interesting part of my presentation, I'm not going to dwell on it. Uh, yeah, people we use the uh, IDs of standard test adequacy criteria, statement coverage, or combinatorial coverage. You know, uh, to uh, and they basically adapt that to the, to the context of deep neural networks and activation values and neurons and stuff like that. But uh, we kind of uh, skip uh, that part. Uh, uh, so uh, the only thing I will say uh, on the next slide is that, for example, one of the most <coughs> uh, recent uh, proposal from XC 2020. Well, there is now, uh, there is some more work in XC 2021, but I haven't had a chance to read and, and make slides about, about it. Uh, it's called Deep Importance. And here, uh, what they try to do is that they try to perform a rather complex analysis to determine what are the neurons among the hundreds of thousands or millions of neurons that actually play a significant part in the prediction of the deep neural network and their coverage measure or their test adequacy measure is uh, uniquely based on those uh, important neurons. So that's a way of uh, defining test adequacy by accounting only for what matters in the deep neural network, what neurons truly matter. But the thing is uh, that is quite uh, uh, remarkable, uh, I want to go to the details uh, about uh, that test adequacy uh, uh, measure is that the analysis is extremely complex. You have a forward and backward analysis. And then, uh, you know, we are going quite far in terms of the complexity of the coverage measures. And then, of course, there are questions around scalability. Another thing, another general remark is not really maybe important, but uh, I've been trying to reproduce all the results uh, published uh, in the literature for those test adequacy criteria. Uh, for those who provided the source code. And I have had huge difficulties reproducing uh, published results. Really, really, uh, uh, and it, it, was, it has been extremely difficult, even by contacting the authors. And uh, sometimes I don't even get answers. So uh, I'm trying to understand how is that possible that the software published cannot reproduce the results in the paper, uh, but it's not always clearly explainable. Um, all right, so there was a paper uh, from XC 2019, and basically uh, all in for regular software, uh, uh, code coverage measures or test adequacy criteria uh, assume homogeneity of inputs and diversity of inputs. Homogeneity of inputs mean that if uh, inputs cover, for example, the same path, uh, they are likely to all fail or all pass. Uh, diversity of inputs means that if you increase coverage, normally you increase the diversity of our inputs. And there was that paper, and again, I'm going to spend much time, uh, uh, the paper of Lee et al., uh, uh, which basically uh, questions uh, those, uh, uh, those assumptions. Uh, and uh, if they say, for example, that adversarial inputs to DNNs are pervasively, pervasively distributed across the input space. Uh, and uh, even if the input space is divided by coverage criteria, it's actually across, uh, distributed across all partitions. Uh, and uh, therefore, that's uh, you know, a violation of that uh, homogeneity of inputs uh, assumption. Uh, and also, they show that uh, uh, very, very different results are obtained with the same coverage. If you generate different test inputs that achieve the same coverage, you get completely different uh, results, for example, in terms of uh, adversarial input uh, uh, detection. Uh, so uh, those are the assumptions tend to break down for the DNA uh, test adequacy criteria that are, uh, that are defined. Uh, and uh, so the question whether uh, uh, using adversarial inputs as a measure of uh, uh, as a measure, as an evaluation measure for those uh, criteria is uh, meaningful. And also they find, uh, they found a weak correlation between those coverage measures in 2019 
the one that exists in them, and the misclassification of uh, natural inputs. Uh, another thing we, another important question is, uh, what does failures, what, what, what do failures mean in the context of machine learning enabled systems? At the model level, we know what they mean. Uh, you either have uh, a large square in terms of a prediction in the regression context or misclassification. But uh, uncertainty is uh, inherent to uh, machine uh, learning training. Uh, we all know that uh, those machine learning models, uh, there are always circumstances under which they will fail, always. It's unavoidable. Uh, and I'll, I'll show some concrete examples of that. So what is then a failure in such a system? Uh, in fact, we expect systems that rely on machine components to be robust to errors of those components since they are uh, unavoidable. And uh, of course, at the system level of failure is some form of requirement violation. Uh, but what that means is that a failure for machine learning level system is not a misclassification or a large core error in, the, in your prediction. Uh, it's the result of both misprediction or misclassifications and the effectiveness of the countermeasures of the system. So, for example, if it's a safety critical system, like at an autonomous system, uh, you should have, you should wrap your machine learning components with a safety monitor that monitors whether, uh, you know, uh, uh, the risk uh, entailed for a given set of inputs to that component, uh, the risk entailed by the outputs. And it's, a, what you are testing is a combination of those two things. So if I take an example uh, from one of our recent uh, uh, paper, uh, so here you, you have a DNN uh, in a larger system uh, predicting key points uh, in an image. Uh, so uh, very often, of course, nowadays, uh, deep neural networks are used for that. And there are many applications such as face recognition, but also drowsiness detection, if you have an internal camera in a car. Uh, and the goal of testing is to find uh, inputs uh, that, uh, of course, uh, poorly lead to poor predictions of as many key points as possible within a given time budget. But when we reflect about that, what is the impact of poor predictions of key points? Uh, you know, in many, many applications, alternative key points can be detected. And a uh, key point can be mispredicted for many reasons because in that case of the position of the head, shadows, you know, and there is nothing you can do about that. So it's up to the system, depending on the circumstances, to decide what key points it should rely on. And if they are misprediction for some key points, it may not have, it may not have any impact on the system, functionality or safety at all. So this is an example of what I was uh, saying before. It's uh, here it would be uh, the, the, the system algorithm to account for key points to perform the task, such as face recognition. Uh, it's the algorithm of the system to handle uh, those expected mispredictions that determine whether or not your system uh, fails. So, uh, I'm going to skip that motion of uh, oracles. Uh, all right, uh, I'll just uh, give maybe a, uh, one aspect. So there are many ways you can uh, also uh, deal with test oracle determine or, or, or not whether or not you have a failure yeah, in, a, in a system. Uh, one way uh, is uh, to have a simulator in the loop, for example. Uh, which is increasingly the case uh, for uh, autonomous uh, systems. Uh, so uh, there are many, of course, other ways uh, you can have uh, domain-specific transformation that are that preserve the semantics of the input, and therefore you don't uh, uh, you don't expect any change in the prediction of the classification. Uh, but what is important uh, is that uh, in our context, that mispredictions are unavoidable, maybe unavoidable. And some of them it may even be acceptable, so as I mentioned. So uh, let me uh, take an example again to follow up with that example. Uh, 
uh, about a system that uh, use uh, uh, that uh, uses uh, simulators for the purpose. So I'll get back to more details later on. But here, basically, the idea is that uh, you have some an input generator uh, that uh, you have a, a simulator that generates images of uh, faces. Uh, that uh, simulator actually generates uh, actual key points because uh, it knows exactly, of course, internally all the details of the image it generates. Uh, and uh, that image is fed to the DNN, and the DNN generates pretty good key points. And of course, uh, the Oracle can simply, in that case, uh, be defined by comparing the actual key points and the predicted key points. And you can, for example, have a threshold. Let's say if that the difference is above a certain degree, uh, then uh, you uh, you have a failure. Uh, so um, that example. So simulators kind of, a, if you can have one, uh, kind of solve the Oracle problem. Of course, uh, there is a question of the simulator fidelity and if the way the simulator fidelity uh, is uh, su sufficient to have uh, an accurate oracle. Uh, let's keep that part. So uh, simulation is a necessity in uh, most uh, domains, uh, increasingly so. It has been so, for example, for a long time in avionics. Uh, of course, the reason is pretty uh, obvious. You have to reduce the cost uh, and risk. And there are many uh, scenarios you cannot even actually uh, test uh, in the field. Uh, the level of fidelity, of course, is an issue. And the competence and realism uh, of the simulator is an issue. Uh, and uh, the level of control also through configuration parameters of the simulator as well is a question. The runtime efficiency of the simulator is important, obviously, for testing purposes. And that technology varies uh, widely across domain. But what is clear is that across increasingly more and more domains, uh, simulators improve and, and are increasingly more readily usable for uh, testing purposes. And they don't need to be perfect to be uh, useful. So even in the simulation domain, now you start having uh, open source simulators and uh, not only simulators, but actually DNN controllers, such as Pilot and Carla, which are increasingly uh, uh, realistic. And uh, the Pilot, for example, is based on many DNN models that, for example, handle traffic like perception, traffic sign perception, lane perception, uh, obstacle detection, uh, and trajectory prediction. So, uh, and uh, it's uh, getting quite. Uh, Realistic. Let's keep that one. Uh, and uh, however, there is a, uh, a work that we did with my colleagues, Fitaj Dongwon and Shiva, that focused on uh, comparing offline and testing. Because, of course, uh, you have work of people trying to feed images to the systems, and all the works that attempt to have, uh, for example, a simulator in the loop. Uh, and where you account from the, for the feedback uh, from the environment. And this is what we call offline and uh, online testing. And the question is that uh, whether uh, that type of online testing uh, with a similar return the loop is actually uh, you know, necessary and brings benefits. Uh, of course, it's much more expensive. Uh, and uh, but uh, that's a study uh, we did recently, and there was a published recently in the paper. And uh, so uh, what we found out is that with online testing, uh, a close in a closed context, more predictions accumulate and eventually cause critical uh, failures, such as in the context of uh, the uh, lane keeping DNN uh, critical lane uh, departure. Uh, so, simpler, cheaper offline testing, uh, based, for example, on single uh, input uh, uh, images, uh, cannot properly reveal safety violations of uh, DNA. It's too optimistic. But, however, uh, offline testing remained the main focus of the published research. So, that's, uh, that was an interesting uh, contradiction. Uh, 
So this was an example where we had a no prediction error, but when we ran the same scenario in an uh, online testing mode, uh, we actually uh, you know, got out of the lane with the DNN in charge of lane keeping. So that leads us to consider the issue of relying on machine learning and functional safety. In order to uh, be able to do that and uh, ensure to a certain degree functional safety, when in the presence of machine learning components, uh, you need to require, you need to assess risks in a somewhat uh, realistic uh, fashion. And uh, what that means is that you need to uh, really clearly characterize what are the conditions of failures and what are the consequences, what is the level of risk associated with those individual uh, conditions that may lead to a high uh, probability of failure. And then you need to decide what is whether that uncertainty uh, is acceptable. As I said, uh, in many systems that rely on uh, machine learning components, such as an autonomous system, there are always conditions where you are going to fail. Um, so, but of course, doing that uh, requires some form of support. I mean, you know, we people cannot do that manually, in part because interpreting, uh, interpreting the results, for example, the test results of a deep neural network is complicated. I try to understand why it fails is complicated. So, some form of automated support is required. Then. Uh, to help with safety in those conditions. So, a uh, uh, last challenge before I move to uh, more concrete research aspect is that uh, there are relatively few empirical studies in industrial context in that type of research. Uh, despite the widespread use of machine learning, there is a it's surprising given the fact that it's so often used. Most papers rely on a, always the same open source examples that are not always uh, very uh, realistic and that are limited to certain domains. There is also in those studies in this field of machine learning uh, testing and analysis, uh, lesser focus on integration and system testing levels, much more at the model level. And uh, it's limited to certain domains. Uh, and also, uh, as I've briefly discussed, when I talked about the, the paper by Lee et al. at TXC 2019 about uh, the criticism of existing studies relying on, on adversarial examples, for example, uh, that there is no widespread agreement on how to perform such study. Every paper tends to be uh, different. And as I said, not reproducible. <laughs> That's another issue. But, all right. So, yeah, I gave you a quick overview of uh, the challenges and the needs. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, I'm sorry if I'm interrupting you. So if you can yeah. do it in like three, four minutes, ah, okay. so that uh, we can ask some questions. All right, then I guess. Uh, so I'm sorry. I'll have to skip. Uh, all right. Uh, I'm very sorry for all this. I guess I'll skip the most interesting part then and go yeah. straight to the conclusion. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, I'll go straight to the conclusion. All right. Uh, so, uh, as we've seen, the testing community uh, contributes by adapting uh, techniques from classical software testing and analysis, such as search-based software testing. Oh, I haven't had a chance to talk about that. Adequacy criteria, metamorphic testing, mutation analysis. Uh, and of course, uh, try to adapt the empirical methodologies we apply in software testing in this uh, context. Uh, and in fact, most of the research has, has focused on the path of least resistance. I mean, it's normal when you have a new field of research. Uh, you know. uh, but uh, my argument, which would have been better supported if I had gone through the entire presentation, is that we need to shift the focus uh, of research in order to increase its impact. Uh, 
We need to focus more on integration and system testing rather than model testing. We should not focus only on model accuracy, but also, uh, especially if we work at the system level, uh, try to uh, focus uh, testing on uh, supporting risk analysis, for example, risk related to safety in a system, risks that are not just due to machine learning components, but to the way we handle the uncertainty around those components within the system, uh, provide support for safety engineering in, in machine learning enabled systems, uh, focus more on black box approaches because white box is not always an option. In fact, it's often not an option in my experience when talking to, uh, you know, uh, when talking to uh, in industry partners or even just industry contacts. Most recently, when I was talking to General Motors, for example, where they were telling me that many of the machine learning models actually come from third parties. Uh, so it would be interesting also to compare uh, solutions that are white box and black box and see whether we actually lose anything in terms of testing effectiveness and, and how much. It's not clear. Uh, we need more industrial case studies, it should be outside the automotive domain, because we know that otherwise uh, probably many of our results are not necessarily uh, uh, trustable. Uh, a lot of the work is focused on the perception layers and images and stuff like that. Uh, we need to work more on, also on the control aspects where machine learning is also used uh, in, autonomous, in autonomous systems, as I've told you at the beginning, for example, in the automotive domain. Uh, we need to focus more on online testing with uh, simulation and hardware in the loop, because as we've seen uh, for safety critical systems, it's the only way to have uh, you know, realistic results. Scalability issues, because if you rely on simulation or large networks, large neural networks, uh, that's going to be a problem. So uh, there are many, uh, unfortunately, I haven't had a chance to talk about our research in this domain and, and the research that exists in this domain. But there are many things you can do uh, to uh, improve scalability, but there is very little research unfortunately. And of course, we need to move beyond stateless DNNs, such as uh, reinforcement learning. Thank you, and I'm very sorry. <laughs> thank, thank, thank you very much. I, I think even your last two slides are uh, very, very uh, interesting and um, definitely uh, inspirative. So, uh, yeah, so, so we give you Applaud here, you, you, you can see they are flying around. And we have uh, uh, two minutes uh, for a question or questions. Uh, so uh, I have seen some chats also like uh, relation to this uh, testing modules and uh, uh, online testing. So which you also had in the, your uh, uh, research directions. Yes. So what is the question? Sorry, I, I can't see them. Yeah, it was uh, up uh, the question. I, I let me see. It was, but I can ask you a question related to that. Okay. So, so I suppose you, when, when you do online testing, you you must know that the context in some way is changing from the training set. How do you know? How how it's possible to know that? Yes. Uh, well. This is something actually on which I haven't worked, but that I've read about. Uh, this is what uh, Rico et al. calls uh, input testing, actually, the first phase of testing where somehow you compare your test scenarios with uh, your training set. And there are, of course, many techniques for that, and even you can rely on existing statistical techniques in order to determine uh, whether, uh, you know, uh, your test inputs belong to any known clusters uh, in the training set. Uh, and of course, uh, there is a question of whether uh, having test inputs that are completely different from your training inputs mean uh, is meaningful. 
because obviously <laughs> that's not what uh, the DNA was uh, designed for. I mean, we know very well that DNAs do not generalize well, obviously, be beyond their training set. So uh, if that's the case, uh, well, there are a lot of questions you need to ask yourself, huh? whether you need to go and retrain your DNA, if this testing scenarios are really meaningful to you before you go further. Uh, but uh, there are many yes, techniques to that. It's what, you know, it's called input testing. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, thank you very much. Since uh, this time is...